So we have Larissa Gorner, and I want to also thank Quint and Hannah for helping get this orchestrated. Thank you very much. And for the so she's a strategic audit manager at Insight. She joined the broadcasting industry in 2001. She started her career as an R&D engineer at IRT, the R&D Institute of the Public Broadcasters in Germany, Austria, Switzerland, where she later took on the role as general manager for marketing and sales. In 2014, she joined Net Insight AB as consultant for sales and product management. Today, she is part of the CTO team and works as a strategic product manager with a major focus on remote production, IP-based, and cloud solutions. She holds a master's degree in electrical engineering and an MBA. Next to engineering, she works in live production and technical operations for more than 16 years in national and international sport production events. Wow, that's very, very impressive. I think I've covered everything. So, you take it away. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you very much for being here. This is. Um, very, a very warm welcome, and I really have to say I have not spoken for a long time in such a very nice environment, so thank you. Um, yeah, and uh, just for me, like for the company background also, so Medinsight is usually used or like what well known as a networking company, however, networking is something that came actually into my career quite late, so my, my, bro my background is also like broadcast, I think this is Good, but um, here, especially in this area, but especially now that we're growing together, you know, and, and I'm sure you have the same challenges as we do when we talk to several people in the organization and we need to get this together. I think these roles become more and more important. And today I'm going to like talk a little bit about these um, new things that we really see we're networking and um, we're the whole growing together of broadcasts and networks makes a sense and helps us into the future of what we're going to do. And this is uh, one of the examples is the at-home production, but then also with a few on the uh, distributor production. So um, just briefly about NetInsight, I'm sure if you're aware, NetInsight is a Swedish company that were founded in 1999, actually out of the university in Sweden, together with Ericsson, it's a spin-off. And they developed always networking products, which are called Nimbra. So you will usually see um, a lot of companies that don't know who NetInsight is, but people do know the Nimbra inside when it's deployed. So <clears throat> this is deployed widely um, with the major networks. And this is also our uh, number one product that we were selling, also where I will refer to in this whole discussion. We did an acquisition of a resource management system deployed, which is Schedule. This happened about three years ago. It's a Florida-based company. And with them, we're also bringing together the resource management and uh, for networks both, and also for people that you need actually in the different broadcast facilities. And there's a third one, which is kind of like a startup that we started in the company, also very focused on this whole life process. So it's all about the life, the interactive, Things and this is a live OTT product which allows to play out synchronized content between your mobile device and your television. So I'm not going to go into much detail. If you have any questions on this later on, I'm happy and also Quint is here and Dan to talk about these two. But today we're going to spend time here because this is, I think, also the most relevant for the future where I think these new workflows are going. Um, yeah, so we have, uh, this is just for a background that you know we're also pretty active here on this side. It's not only Europe, but we're actually active across the globe running more or less every major network that does contribution um, and, and transfer in the US. It's quite well known that we have the um, different stadiums connected here, um, the Major League Soccer, Major League Baseball, uh, the NBA, uh, together with the Switch, and this we do over this media product. But now I stop talking product, and now we talk really about the different things we can create. And this is when it came to remote production. So I will always refer to that term remote production. And there is the other one, which is at home production. There is Remy and integrated. And I guess everybody of you does know this is actually when you have just a camera inside, but you produce more or less everything from your central facility, right? You would have a great thing here with all these vision mixers and switchers over there with your big, big hub. 
But there has been quite an evolution. So it started really early, 2012, when BBC and SVT did their first things. And then 2013, actually, SVT started to do that more or less every week. They're still doing this. They did about like 10,000 productions until now. And their entire workflow is built around that. Um, then we had another few coming in, mainly for the big event years, like Olympics they are done, and all that kind of things. Yes? What's SVT? Uh, SVT is the Swedish public broadcaster, I'm sorry. I will, I will talk about those a bit uh, in more. So this is Swedish public broadcast, this is Swiss public broadcast, so a lot of Europeans, but then these networks I'm sure you know, but then we have also South American networks. So everywhere where actually it was possible to put stuff into the network, and uh, just produce it from somewhere home with the aim to save and with the aim to produce more and more efficient. So, and that's it actually, as I said, you know, this is how we produce today still. It's a bit different, usually you, here you are even so much bigger in the US. I mean, we, we run, you know, with one truck out there, you run t sometimes with three uh, or four and it's also like this whole concept, how many people <coughs> there are deployed and the travel times. It's, it is here much bigger, so I can just say, but that makes even more, you know, this whole effort much better to move them back home. So what we see now is a lot of broadcasters really building central hubs for the broadcast facilities and putting all of the technology into the network. Um, why? Yeah, I said, you know, more content, increased productivity, less travel. Travel is the most thing, right? So people probably want to move to Rio for the Olympics, but then for Sochi it was another thing. And then, you know, um, now we had, in Russia, we had a lot of actually countries that did not use their production in Russia. So for example, German television, they did their full production remotely from back home. Um, higher quality, why? So higher quality actually, and this is something I did not believe because it's also my background in the beginning, but the thing is, once they produce from back home, they have a much easier access into the archiving. They have, when there is something going wrong, they can't, can call an engineer. You don't have that on site, especially not for the big events. It's always a big challenge. So they see that actually, because there are more people that can work with the content, they actually increase this um, productivity. And use more talent. So also like in training purposes and so on. So the big networks like to really introduce that, getting younger people on content that they would actually never work with, right? So who can work for the Olympics? But once it's back home, there is a highlight operator, somebody that can finally deal with that. So you can train them also. Um, <clears throat> so there are like some kind of different types of events. So you have um, that deployed for large events or multi-venue events, like as I said, the Olympics, right, where we run that, um, and they have like three, four, five venues. They run unilateral cameras, like dedicated cameras, for example, NBC actually builds their total overlay at the Olympics for the unilaterals, but also then you have, you know, Germany or Switzerland, they put like probably five or six cameras where they show their own teams, all that, and they want to produce them from back home. So they take the world feed, that's already produced and they produce all the rest from the different venues. But instead of having an OB van or a container on all that sites which got to eat up you the costs, logistics, they run that either, either from the IBC in the central production or like the Swiss broadcasters did, they did from Pyeongchang run their entire stuff from back home in Zurich. That is quite cool, I have the case later, but there it was really that they said, okay, we just have some pre-mixing, they did shading here, but then for the actual content, for the mix and stuff, they did everything from there and produced this in different areas. What is uh, IBC? IBC is the International Broadcast Center, so um, that's when we're actually all the big networks sit in, right? So this is on the, the bigger events. You go in there and then you have the world feed. This is probably OBS, which does the Olympic feed, or you have HPS, they do this for the FIFA World Cup or some other, or athletics, and that's, they produce a world feed. And then you have um, all the different networks, like their NBC usually has a big hall, they're really big. And then you have some smaller ones, you know, from across every country that have the rights to produce that, that have their own stations in there. And that's actually, it costs a lot of money. So to put stuff in there, you need to ship it. All your, um, all your production gear is tied up, of course. So there again, 
they want to like not travel that all over. And this is just an example of what we built now uh, together with ARD and ZTF for the um, European Championship Athletics in, in Berlin. And there they had all the venues were actually in Glasgow apart from the um, the main running and athletics like 100 sprints and that kind of stuff that was in Berlin. But they didn't want to like get all the people over to Glasgow. They wanted to leave them back home. So they actually left 90 people back in Berlin that ran in four director's rooms. So they actually had two OB events there, four vision mixers, and they ran four parallel productions all the time from Glasgow whenever there was something. And they did swimming, gymnastics, rowing, and triathlon. For all the others, they just did the fully produced feed. But here they produced their own feeds remotely. They had a 10 gig link between the two, like Glasgow and Berlin, and ran it all over the network. The funny thing here was, they, they did run it over um, the, like this dedicated one, and they were quicker than the actual world feed that they got from the, <coughs> the ones that yeah, was produced. Like, if you was it in that case, and they needed to delay the world feed because they were too quick. So this is where we already are. That once we run them over the network, then we can be so quick that we can solve them. Um, yeah, that's just from, like, um, as I said, this example where they ran that back from home. So that was just their, like, more or less, like a, a lot of multi that they had on site where they did, you know, some, um, they did the, the uh, camera shading there, but then they brought back all the signals back to Zurich and did remotely control them there. That's the other part. So once, and, and that's a totally different model. So once we run, like, in this recurrent production, so we have mentioning software in the US is produced every week from Univision's twice as a remote setup and they all the people are sitting in Florida and actually edit everything that's coming up in whatever stadium across the states. And that comes every week. It's it's a different kind of thing because here you have a lot of people that are actually getting happy because of this. Um, because nobody wants to sit every weekend on the venues, like probably Rio, but not in the stadiums across, you know, where you need to travel, you have, you're away from your family for two, three days. So it's a lot of social things that are involved and that help those. So, <laughs> just to give you an idea, so this is what we do um, also every week there with uh, TV2 in Denmark, and they have this rack. So they actually run um, several, six cameras on site. They have five people on site, that's it. They, they pull out this rack of their little bus that they have. That's it, they have the five cameras, plug it into the network, run the power on, and they are live and up. And this is how they do their production in parallel from the different ones. Every week, three, four times. Um, for handball in that case, handball is like football here. <coughs> handball in Denmark. Denmark is a funny country because it's very long. So it's not a distance as you have here, but it's kind of like the same approach. So. People don't need to drive them. Are you Same? saying handball? It's handball. Okay. Yes. It's not a very big sport here, I know. <laughs> but that one is. So that's basketball, right? So basketball is not a very big sport in, in, um, in Germany, but in Spain it is. So it's actually kind of like number three in Spain. And for them, a movie star is the, the local telco. So it's actually Telefonica's broadcast um, thing from the Spanish public telco. And they are now running um, six cameras every week for three games in parallel and have also this kind of like rack. Actually, I think you can even build the smaller where they run them back. They run Rust Valley cameras. I come back to that later because we actually did something with you guys where we can make this rack half the size so that they are all, you know, that all the base units are back home. But I come to that. So just in, in general, how does it usually look like? We, and, and this is not really, it's not rocket science, but this is how we see it from a networking perspective to really see the different levels, how we need to protect signals. So for video, it's, you know, whatever signals come there, of course now it's, it's um, a lot of SDI and remote still. It's like we talk all a lot of IP, but in remote production, people are not that much into it yet because 
remote production is already a big step, but it's now coming. So people see that you know Dash 6 is now very mature, they, they trust in it, 2110 is the next step, of course. Um, for audio, all the different signals you want to run, and um, then you have you know your control data, tally, or your word clock, probably you don't have GPS access on that site, so you cannot time all your devices, so that needs to run, and you need some backup mechanisms. That can be over 5G, that can be over the internet, but you still, when your broadcast is cut, you still need to have something because this is all you have. There is not, there is no OB van. There is no recording device over here. So that all travels over the wide area network. So what is this wide area network thing? And this is where the big, significant difference comes apart from the local area network to the wide area network. So. In the local area network, we all know you have great switches over there, and, and, and Bob showed me around this morning, you have a great environment here at the facility where you run local LAN switches, and you know you can more or less provision as much as you want there, uncompressed, you will have data rates of you know a couple of terabytes. That's impossible to WAN, because once you do WAN, you always need to go over a, tele a telecom provider, that can be an AT&T, that is uh, a lot of different ones. I learned today, they actually are the different states, you have different ones, so you need to run over there. It's a lot of stuff. If you wanna do a remote production, you also don't go there and you say like, I'm gonna have like 20 cameras. No, it's probably gonna be like, yeah, I need to hire a 10 gig pipe or a 15 gig pipe. And then you need to make absolutely clear that once you run over these wide area networks, everything comes out at the other end of course, synchronized and also with the same quality that you did allow that. So let's look into that. When we look into the video, and this is something that we actually started to develop because we can solve this and run everything back home, but of course, you want to like start to reinvent the workflows because now we have the possibilities, things are different. And this is something we um, developed on that side together with. Um, Grass Valley, and that is that we have usually a semi hybrid fiber cable that you would run, but now these cameras have an output which is 10 gig, and here actually comes out the 2022 6 signal. And that's something you know you can now connect to a switch locally in a LAN, no problem if you have 10 gig. But what if you want to run this over a wide area network? It's not possible. 10 gig pipe, nobody can afford. You can go to AT&T, say like, oh, I want a 10 gig pipe from here to Washington. They say like, okay, sure. It's going to take you three, four months. Um, then you can have it, and it's going to cost you, I don't know, a million or two million if you need this for two days. So nobody will do it, right? So you need to compress it to plug it into something that you can do. And here, the big thing was, that, I said before, the size of these racks that you currently run with all the base stations in and with all the different stuff, they're pretty big, so we wanted to leave that these base stations are inside. We take the 10 gig output, we compress it, and we run it over. So this is how it looks like. Now we get a bit more time. So the whole setup we run is like on this 10 gig pipe that you actually output of the different cameras. We take it, and this is, you know, for Dash 6, we have some overhead on this SDI signal. We take it into our Nimbra box here and compress it down. We transparently transport all the audio signals that you would generate. Yes? When you say Dash 6, <coughs> you the tool. Simply 2022 Dash 6? Exactly. Yeah. Yes, sorry. If I, I can be, but yes. So it's the Simply 2022 Dash 6 IP signal that we take. Yeah, so it's actually SDI over IP, still with the same <coughs> format, so we're not in the 2110, 20, 30, 40 range, but this we can take, it's, it's an IP protocol, and we can compress it down that it actually fits into a 150 megabit. So this compression we do with JPEG 2000 in that case. Um, JPEG 2000, I'm not sure how familiar we're with this, um, but I guess there is a long history here as well. Um, I think it's, it's the great encoder for that application is because it's low latency, you can actually get it almost lossless if you want to, if you run it with about like 160, 170. This is what we have, megabits. 
And it will always give you this intrinsic encoding that you need if you have a still picture, if you have something you need to go in and zoom in or you need to process afterwards. So this is why we set our entire stuff here on the JPEG 2000. So here, in that case, you know, we're actually down to about like 150 megabits. So in one big pack, you can fit about like six cameras that you can already transfer back. You decode them, and then they go into your XCU. So what does it mean? You just have some camera hats on the side. You have some of the cameramen doing that, but all of the other people are back home doing your production, shading your cameras. We usually run on a delay about like 100 milliseconds. This. <coughs> Now, I actually jumped a bit on this side already. What we do, this is just for the video, right? Video is always the big problem. I mean, video is this big data rates. Now we talk HD. When we talk UHD, it's getting much worse. Um, but still, the compression that you need to have is so relevant because you need it for the white area. The audio, we don't touch. Audio usually is such a nice bit, uh, small bit rate, so we don't touch it. We run it through our Ethernet transport. And this fully transparent transport, also like the private data that you have for the telemetrics, and pass it through, and then next to that, have all the other signals, and keep them in sync. There is a, um, there is a major thing which is different by the mechanism we have in wide area networks. And that is, because we control usually everything across this telco provided infrastructure, so we have these are switches, we have them, but we also run an overlay between these different boxes. We can always determine how many packets are done, so we actually provide a synchronous overlay over the unsynchronous IP transport that's under the IP LS. Great thing, it's really not made for broadcast. Broadcast, we want to we need synchronized uh, packets, and uh, we have always dedicated things that need to come in and out. It was great in the formal world, you know, SDI gave us this, it was intrinsic in the transport. Now it's done. So what we did, and this is our manner, is we actually introduced an overlay where you have the synchronization type. This is one of my hardest words, by the way. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I think I said everything of this. Um, this is kind of like a module that you would run with it. That's also another thing, right? Check it 2000 compared to H.264. You can run much more processing on the same card because your FPGAs won't eat up that much when it's J2K as when it is H.264. So you should really need much more recognition when you have H.264 encoded. And it also gives now, especially looking at H, uh, UHD, when you put down the four quadrants, JP2000 can fully replicate the picture, whereas the Bob structure can really bring you into trouble with the different patterns. Um, that was just one of the examples I actually put in here. They are like SVT, that's the Swedish public broadcaster. Um, we're actually building together with um, with Brass Valley and some other manufacturers for next year, the biggest remote production ever that will be an 80 plus camera production that they will run in the north of Sweden, 700 kilometers north of Stockholm. That's for the Ski World Cup. So, and they will produce everything from back home in Stockholm, but the director wants to sit up there. So he wants to have his multi is up there, he wants to see his panels, and he wants to have that also within the delay. So we run a 100 gig pipe down there, and for him, up a little multi so he can be on site. All the production people are back in Stockholm. <coughs> yeah. yeah, that's, that's going to be fun. I <laughs> hope I, I get enough picture, I'm going to send it to you when that's done. Um, one other thing, because we, we, you know, I mean, it's it's a lot of video people here. I, I learned this is like the video hub here of the whole state so far, but audio is actually even trickier when it comes to remote production. So for, for video, the challenge is um, the bandwidth, right? For audio, the challenge is the delay. So when you have somebody standing on your remote site, on your event site, and he needs to talk with somebody over there, and we know this from satellite communication, this is a problem. But now, even his mixer 
is on that side. So what he hears in his ear is going to have a delay. Nobody can, can live with this. This is not possible. So what we developed here, um, together with uh, actually too many factors, but in that case, Korek was um, the ones bringing that out, was that they leave the audio processing on the site where the actual thing happens. So that the guy with his IFB in his ear, that's the thing where he hears actually what they are saying, you know, from the studio and also his partner, that he doesn't have any delays on that, but also gets the full life mix on his ear. <coughs> and all of that signals going back, and then with that audio mixer here, he can switch between his remote venue, but also between his local studio production with more or less no delay. Because audio, we don't add any delay because we have no uh, encoding in between. So that's the big, uh, that was the big deal that we actually leave the processing on this side. And this is also, you know, when we're now thinking about different video workflows that might come up, where do we want to put the processing units, right? If it's very small processing units, probably we want to leave them here, but maybe you can also leave them somewhere else. Yeah, so that's what they can do. So actually back home, they, they mix their, their um, audio mixer console directly on top here and, and can control remotely, you know, both that one who is out there over the wide area network and the one that is local and run this for whatever signal, so that can be all the signals, everything except Dante has a problem, it can only accept seven hops over a switch, so that one is really timed out. At a discussion today, we're also, you know, the timeout of the travel between the network, once it exceeds too, lo too, too long of the time, then it will just send package. What will happen will just like fully flood your switch. This is what we saw. So now you need to introduce some other mechanisms. ARP, for example, helps you very much to structure that. It will just tell you, okay, once the, once the package is there, you send a reply back, and then he knows, okay, now it's stopped really sending. So it's pretty simple, but we just need to do it. And these are all these new things we now find out once we run into that whole IP stories. Um, yeah, and that kind of setup we used uh, for the Australian Open that year. Um, where Gearhouse was uh, producing for seven networks their entire coverage for the Australian Open. So they did um, actually not a very far remote production. But Australian Open charged so much money for putting uh, containers and, and all that on, on the compound that they said like, okay, you know what? We're gonna build our central hub just seven miles away down there in Melbourne where we have a facility anyway. So they put down there 200 people they put in a variety of production rooms. They did both the Australian Open, but also um, the Olympics are there. And they ran the full production from there. So they actually had just like seven, eight kilometers covered. But the impact was people had great catering. They have been working there for three weeks. Um, they had everybody that could work there. So accreditation usually is a big problem. You don't have that space. Now they could build this much cheaper yeah, a little bit down, but these are the new approaches that we see really a lot coming up and where you can play around, right? They, they run all their remote heads from there, so for the different remote cameras, they all went up and did the actual entire production from there. It just had some problems up there. <coughs> So now we come to the core, which is like the, the transport. And for remote production over wide area network, I said like, you know, this is gonna be the thing, right? So this is the part we solve. So we, with the things we do, we're not in the venue, we're not in the local area networks, we're not, you know, we're uh, your usual Cisco switches, but we're on the edge once it really hits the wide area network. telco based networks that can be um, SDH, transport, not sure if you're familiar, that's something really old, but we have a lot of that still around. This is a synchronized transport that they use for packet switching. Um, IPMPLS is something I guess uh, most of you have heard. This is where actually all the big telcos switched in the recent years. Um, and then you have, of course, some um, WDM or um, other multiplexes or dark fibers where everybody can run it over, I say. But once you really run over long distances, you will hit one of them. 
And the most important thing is that your performance to do all of that should be always the same, whatever the underlying infrastructure is. And this is what we're doing. So we actually put, once we have the different, um, uh, the different video, audio, and uh, data channels, we, we put that into the box and transport it over. It's usually always bi-directional, so we can run in. And then there also comes in a backup channel, and I said that before, but here for the backup, most important part is, you know, you can never now lose control because the recording is there. So it needs to be something. It's 5G, we see this a lot, we see a lot of LTE. There is, of course, satellite, but satellite usually is way too expensive to have. I mean, here we're talking like probably 10 cameras or 20 cameras. It's not like one camera, right? You don't have a program be produced. This is like every single one you need to get over. So you need to have a very good backup mechanism here as well. And this is now majorly used also over the public internet. <clears throat> so the challenges, of course, once they travel this, is everybody thinks like this is the first thing, right? It's delay. So people need to work on that. You're, um, but and 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 this this needs to travel long time. So where does this delay actually come from? And there are several ones. So of course we have jitter, and this is something you know you need to have something to cope with. It can be not a total nightmare. When we really talk professional media, professional production, it needs to be on a certain level that you get that you jitter like the delay in your packets is going to be fine because this is going to be the one that will hurt you once you need to play out all of your packets and you don't want to have a black frame drop packets or anything the other one is the encoding <coughs> delay, of course because we have we need to have any kind of encoding uncompressed is not possible it's just still even though you know you have the luxury here of crazy backbones in the u.s you know and terabit but nobody can still pay it and won't for the next 10 years because then you will have UHD and then 100 big packets left in anymore. And so we need to have some kind of encode. It needs to be very fast. And we need to have a constant delay so that we can work with. And then, of course, you have a round trip time. So we usually calculate with five microseconds per kilometer for the production from Pyeongchang back to Switzerland. You can. That was the first time where actually you could physically feel it that once you really run it that there is some delay added for if you don't have these much things if you do here for example east coast west coast you're about like 100 milliseconds so that's in the in the term of a wireless camera shading yeah so usually all the people working in an ob truck they're used to that kind of delays so and, and Sync is something, I, I think you struggle with this right now a lot for IP, with a lot of people do this. This is, um, I think, the core thing once we run this, because we have a lot of signals, and they're going to multiple places, but you need to have one time base to actually make it work. Okay? So you probably want to have a backup, but that's it. So they need to all be in Sync. And this is... The video sync, of course, that can be your genlock, your PTP. We have a inbuilt, um, an inbuilt clock in our transport where we can reproduce the PTP signal on any outcoming box. We already do this for a long time for genlock, and we were lucky enough that it's actually uh, accurate enough that it still can run within the PTP, so we can produce that. Why? Because there are countries that cannot use GPS, because sometimes your GPS clock doesn't do what you want, and probably you're sitting somewhere where your GPS cannot even be generated. So this is where that comes in, and especially for this remote, remote and distributed workflows, this is one of the major parts. Ah, yeah, and, and that's actually one very important one, actually the last one. I don't want to forget. So once we run telco networks, it's not that you have like your your connection, which is like a one side connection. No, probably you need to run different service providers. So if we run here, if we run just local links, you might get 500 megabits there and then 500 megabits there, and you need to run them all together. So they need to be also in sync across different paths. And also, you need to have a backup, right? Everybody probably in the room knows 2022-7 being hitless protection, so they switch between the two routes. You can also do this, of course, across an entire network, which is not your own, right? 
that works in the LAN and also works in the WAN, but for that, you need to have a synchronized underlay that actually plays you out the frames accurately so you can reproduce them. And that you can switch. Yeah. Who else that's done? Um, restricted bandwidth, I was on that alongside, just jump on that. But packet loss actually comes because it, your network is full. So now when you have a network which is not your own, and you cannot like invest in more and more capacity because it's the capacity you get because you now don't run over normal networks, it's public networks, then you will have something like a 10 gig ring or 15 or 100 gig. So everything you have needs to go in here. But they probably don't give you 100 gig, probably they just give you like 90 gig. So you need to have a mechanism that tells you how much bandwidth do I always have available across the entry network. And this is something that we now also saw when we do 21.10. And this is where 21.10-21 came in. This is for the burst control, I come to that later. Because we also had this problem in the LAN now. In the WAN this is coming, because this was always the same. It was something that we were aware of, but now we also see this in the land, so we want to have this adaption, of course, across there too. So, and that's all fine, you know, I mean, I just saw, like, we, we now talked about point to point, but this is not where actually the whole thing is coming from. So when we talked, I showed you these multi-venue things, it's not point to point, it's like multiple venues, they run multiple things, they run like three football games, four basketball games, all in parallel, they all run there, they all run over different paths, and they all hit the facility. So there need to be mechanisms that actually can cope here that have that bandwidth res uh, reserved here, so that you also know what all is coming in. So it needs to be really deterministic across the, all these different ones, and it should be simple, right? You don't want to like end up provisioning every of these single slots here and say, like, this is going to be like two megabit, this is going to be like 100. 10, no, this needs to be kind of like automated. But what is simple, once you really know what's going on, it's not that hard to really build a software application on top that helps you. It's still hard, but it's okay. So <clears throat> that's where we come in with, you know, that whole things that we did actually right before um, the 2110 standards came up or dash seven standard. So we did Hitler's protection first time in 1997 when it was needed for, um, a terrestrial network that needed to go to different transmitters. So for single frequency networks, we can run hitless um, uh, one, uh, one plus one. And now, of course, the seven is the thing where we can also adapt. So it switches seamlessly from one stream to another. Forward error correction is something you would introduce. So you have some, um, uh, you have buff on top. So uh, every, I guess everybody knows the different mattresses you can run with FEC in that part. And then there is this great new thing which came with this whole internet discussion, which is ARQ, automated repeat request, that actually it sends, it waits until something comes back, probably it doesn't come, so it sends a bit longer, but that actually allows you to find a good compromise between a buffer you have. Yeah, that will just set in and the delay that you might probably create, but it will always allow you to stream without any interruption. So this is the nice thing about ARQ. So these different ones allow you to protect your network. Service isolation, and I put that there because this is something which is really different on how we do things than other do things. So Everybody knows a gateway. I guess you, every manufacturer has a gateway product. We, we don't actually have a gateway product. This is different. Of course, we need to go to IP, probably from SDI. But once you have a gateway product, usually everything is together trunked on one, on one uh, IP and you will stream it out. We actually isolate every single service and provision any single service with a certain bandwidth, and that's maintained end to end. And this is about this delay and this overlay that we can build. So we can also say, okay, we know exactly how many packets are needed, when they're dropped, whatever, that we can reset them. And this is um, what helps to make this end-to-end -end resource allocation possible. And then you also don't need to over-provision because you know, I'm gonna need a gig for all of my cameras, all of my things to get back, and you know it end-to-end, -end, so you need to provision it end-to-end. -end. And then you can also optimize this. And this happens together with the traffic shaping, so you need to have 
this doesn't run over the public internet, okay? So this kind of stuff, you can do this like when you have one, two, if you have like 20 cameras, everybody knows what then will happen. It's gonna be, it looks like crap, but we're getting closer and closer to that. Yeah? So things are already possible to run over public internet, even up to 10 cameras if needed, but bigger compression, and you accept a bit of a bigger delay. It's all the great things we did for 30 years. We throw away a little bit, but it's, it's, it's a compromise to get it over. And JPEG 2000, I don't need to spend too much time on this, but for um, remote production, this is actually the codec that we still see, which is the most common, because it gives you a great trade-off between um, the, com like the, the bandwidth and also the picture quality you want to have, because it's not distribution, this is contribution. You still want to have the best, you want to have your essence streams, you want to have your camera streams that you can record them later on as well, and that your replay systems have them in the best shape, and you can also put them in the archive. Um, those, I actually more or less touched all of them, but network performance monitoring, of course, you always want to see how much is used in, in the network. I, you know, currently everybody brings out kind of like a lot of these broadcast controllers for in the facilities. There, you usually see like how much is probably used in the net, but you cannot determine it between the different points yet. So we see some things now coming up, but this is really where you once hit a switch and all, everything comes in from the different side, you have a bursty, a bursty behavior. And this is when the switch will drop packets. It's, it's not a work of science. Thing. So you need always to know how much can be the maximum capacity I will have in my network. And of course you can buy like five, six more switches, you will add capacity, all fine. But not for remote production and not for distributed production. Um, yeah, so I, I think those I explained more or less very well. This is also for the audio transport, so <coughs> we run them, they hit them. There is also like for intercom transport, and this I just wanted to build out because we here um, together with Riedel did um, the AS67 transport over wide area network, and we did even run this back from Kerchan, which was a very nice thing because here it was important that we also could transport the PTP. And once we could transfer the PDP, IA67 as well as 2110 is not a big issue anymore because it's more or less more the accuracy of doing that. And that was one of the first um, applications <coughs> where we really ran them transparent um, over that. And this is because we have a new jitter performance, so we actually cut the Ethernet transport we're doing, we cut them into much smaller pieces. So that whenever anything is sent out, it is as accurate as it so, um, remote production, as I said, great thing, service isolation you need, you have your bandwidth reservation that you need to have, and of course some software defined me mechanisms, and this is just the beginning, right? And here it's still like point to point, we have one infrastructure, you know, this is beautiful because whatever infrastructure you want to use, you don't want to take care of this, it's like, you know, not everybody is a network engineer or will provision your networks in the future, so you should just plug it in and actually it should run. So this is something where we want to take care of that this is as simple as possible. And then, of course, get these uh, values. So I'm talking about remote now. And, um, you know, we have one menu, we have another arena, all great. They all go back to this production facility and now we run into a new problem because so we have now these broadcasters, they build them eh, a lot in Europe or also for the others. Now they run out of space in their production facilities because they don't have enough direct room. So we see things that they actually put the ob van outside in the yard and produce from there because they didn't have that. So that comes to this whole evolution, what I think IP is the best thing that could happen that brings us this now because it's gonna be much simpler. And that's going to be when it's getting distributed, right? So we will not only have like one production facility, and we see this is coming, and we see the engineering already building these kind of workflows just for the events right now, but then implementing that long term, we might have another production facility. And here probably, this is just where all your processing is, and all your servers, and here is actually where your people will work. 
And here is going to be where your arena is with just a few cameras and camera men on site. And probably some audio or some other processing will be done in the cloud. We leave this one for now, okay? But on another part. So again, all of them need to have the signals at the same time to work on that. It needs to be synchronous. They need to have the same kind of time base, same the quality level that they need to have. And this is where we see really where IP makes a big difference in what was possible before and what is now. What we do call distributed production, there are a lot of like different terms right now when we cross this, but distributed is the one we heard most so that you actually spin it out. And this is actually where it cannot be just a change of cable, right? So it cannot be that we just throw out all of these SDI cables and replace them with uh, the IP cables instead of really thinking about what we're doing there and not just like replicating the old world into the new. But there are a lot of these new possibilities that are given and that's now enabled and I think, and this is gonna be my last excerpt on IP. So we went there, this I think is where we pretty much are and that's gonna be the next step to go distribute it. And then of course, also get the cloud involved for some processing. You see this, it's coming up, but it's not there for life yet because it's not quick enough, but it's just a matter of time until we have that part as quick as we need it with the delays. And then we need to optimize these resources and the workflow consistency. So these workflows that are created right now, they need to be replicable and they cannot build them. So when we see currently the broadcasters building their workflow, they look very much that once they do this on this event, that the people working with this can do this on all the other events as well in the same manner. And this workflow consistency currently is very technically focused because everybody's into, oh wow, we need to do all this IP configuration and all these things. But then we actually see that it ties into um, the, the ways that it's just becoming plug and play systems, right? The, like these racks you saw, they're just getting smaller and smaller and they're putting them in, in cars and then we get the packages and the workflows are consistent. And of course, automation is key. And I really, actually, so this whole thing, and we had a nice chat about this today. I don't see really a lot of AI happening in life. I think AI that will take quite a long time, but it's a lot of people currently speaking about this, so probably we will get in there, but I think key is automation. So the more we can automate, that's gonna be the key in this transformation. So, 2110, this is gonna be the thing, and I know you're working with it, I guess most of you, and we have it everywhere, and it has a lot of stacks, and it's actually great when we do it in the facility, but when we want to extend this, we want to have the same ascent streams, like the dash 20, the dash 30, dash 40, we want to have access to on all the different facilities. And then you probably have like a facility which is already IP, you have another one, and this is just a broadcast, right? This can be just the same campus that's still running on STI, and you have an IP, so these need to go together. So you will have multi-domain implementations, and there will be even probably broadcast controllers, right? You will have um, mechanisms from various manufacturers that will tell you what they are, and their IP addresses that they give you won't be the same once they are published into the wide area network. So there is gonna be a lot of work to do, same thing, hybrid implementations. I think we will live very, very long with STI. I, I'm not sure, does anyone not think this in here? Please raise your hand. But I think it's gonna be there another 10 years in any facility, for sure. Um, and the traffic aspects that I mentioned before, you need to maintain them now, even worse. So this is where I said the burst control within the 2110 over tw uh, and dash 21, which says how much, you know, you need to provision your equipment that it's actually how much can it really send that it's not bursting with all the other stuff. And we're just starting, right? So we, when we really built the big facilities, they will all stream into that, all the switches will get overloaded, and we know that already we're there, but we can deal with all this in a local area network, but once we run up in these distributed networks, we really need to know how much is needed, so we need to have this burst control there as well. 
yeah, and the exact clock. Um, this, I, I think I actually may should be jump over that, but it's like for the broadcast transport, something that we see, and this is so good when it comes to the WAN. So when we had SDI, and this was all running on, on really synchronized networks, so these are network protocols and telcos, SDH and so on. It's still around, by the way, quite a lot, actually. I would say probably 40, 50% of all the telcos, so when you do something, it's still there. And that's just for the US. If you go like Asia, this is really, really common. Um, and there, we had SDI on top, and we wanted to have like other things, because it was all static. So this was like really static transport. They want to have the flexibility, right? So bandwidth flexibility, dynamic capacity, interface conversion, that all needed to them. Then they switched over the telcos, and this is all here telco service providers to IP, so they needed to have like on top a control because now they had these all these different um, these different paths. They didn't know really what's going on. We needed to really control this unsynchronous network, right? And then also have this bandwidth reservation across everything. This is like when IP and PLS is an undertaking. And now we put on this unsynchronous network. We put another unsynchronous service, and we want to make it synchronous, right? So that's just for you went. So we need to have mechanisms that allow this, and this is majorly the timing and the burst control, so these need to be the things that are the most stable things across anything, and I'm sure you all ran into the PTP issues we have, and that needs to be maintained across, so just <laughs> from, <laughs> from our perspective. It's a freight train coming. Yeah, <laughs> this was one of the major things, and I think we're just to to see it from you know this is the world where we come from. This is the world I think where most of you in the production side come from. But we needed to build this inside to let actually these different services run on top. And now with IP, it's not really the rocket science because we have it already there. But there are new things in production which actually come in which we didn't need to cope with that much. So that's actually where we work a lot together. And this is just something really, really telco based, but that is um, we work in a group that's actually the group um, that will define 702110 services over the wide area network. It's a group that's currently in the video services forum, but actually to be expected to become a assembly standard. So currently it just was kicked off. But that is because once you <laughs> even have IP in the studio, it's not the same as if you have IP in the wide area network because these are all the challenges, like flow protection, the essence alignment, you want to keep the essence across multiple domains, and um, it needs standardization because people think at the moment a lot that just because we have IP, we can just plug it into whatever router I have at home and it will come out probably on the other side. But I just want that today I bring you a bit closer that the wide area network is really, unfortunately, much more complicated and it's like a dark, terrible hole where we need to kind of like do the best thing. Because in the LAN, we can just throw capacity on top, but in the WAN, we can. So we need to control that much better. And this is where. We're discussing all these mechanisms. It's great. Um, we have great contributions, great networks in that. So I hope that comes out very quickly so we can run these distributed production workflows. So, and I'm pretty spot on with my time. <laughs> all right. So, conclusions. Um, we see really that this whole future for that new workflows when it comes to IP goes in there once we can do that. And actually, the far picture is, and <laughs> Mark will laugh at me when I say this now, that all the vision mixers can sit at home in front of their television and mix from there. And you can just spin up wherever you want. And you have actually just the poor camera lens so that need to go to the action. But all the rest of them work from wherever, probably software based. So this is. Where I think on the very long term, it might probably end or not. Remote production is like this open path. So this is where we do all the trials now. It's great. We can improve the workflows, but actually always with the aim to reach that. And to have that, we need to have this essence streams, this distributed streams over the different 
um, the different uh, distributed workflows, like that we have audio here, we have video here, we have data here, so that everybody can actually use that and work on what he needs to do. And yeah, and I think I am here at the end of my presentation. So um, yeah, I hope I hope that was a nice insight for you for the wide area network and. I'm going to do a round here for some more questions. Probably I'm not technical enough, which probably some of you might think. But you can come over and then we can get pretty technical. You can complain to me about that. Got the level somehow. No, I thought yeah. it was great. Thank you. It was super Thank interesting you. too. It was really yeah. interesting. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.